next chair. <laughs> have, you guys, have you guys any submissions for the uh, quick talks? Do you remember uh, no. Oh, yeah. Uh, we don't have any yet for the the beginner introductory. Uh, Vanessa was uh, was actually supposed to give the talk. Uh, give a talk on. Uh, you know, in, not, not an intro talk, like, like uh, data science and deep learning, uh, but she she had to postpone it because she got a job oh. as a data scientist. Oh. Like, yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> so she uh, she's going to be giving the main talk next month, okay. but there's still room for a skill talk uh, and or a beginner's talk as well. Uh, so I was very happy for Casey to jump in. Hey. This month, and talk about airflow, which is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, but first, because maybe we'll be able to use something here in Hayes Talk. We'll see. Probably. We'll see. Uh, I'm I'm going to go first and talk about using voluptuous and data classes together. Is there a contest somewhere I don't know for the stupidest Python import uh, module name? I think voluptuous is put right, they right won. in there. I'm I mean, them a it may be sexist as well. So you know, it's really, it's like a twofer. I I I still prefer import anti gravity, <laughs> <laughs> as useful as that module is. <laughs> yes. So that's that's just me. All right. Do, 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 do. Yay, OBS. So, yeah, talking about Airflow and Voluptuous plus data classes. Oh, actually, now that I think of it, um, one of the other libraries that we were uh, talking about at PyCon at one of the ETL uh, sessions was Great Expectations, which is another one of these ETL focused libraries that's uh, testing your data pipeline outside of your actual code. So you can use uh, great expectations to say, uh, is this a uh, test that my database connection is valid uh, and that I'm, I, I can ping it and then test that the following tables exist that I need and then test that all these rows exist and they're the, they're the expected types. So if something changes upstream of you know, the data that you pull in to your application, you know what went wrong, and that your application isn't wrong or isn't broken. The data source is broken. That's that's one of the, you know, the core use cases that they have for that particular library right now. Uh, but they call each of these test things expectations. We expect this, so it's called great well, that, expectations. That kind of follows the tradition of the expect utility analytics, which mm -hmm. so, is an automation, an early automation. Uh, but uh, Voluptuous, rather than uh, Voluptuous is a data validation tool, so once we already have the data in, uh, before we start working with the data at all, we want to make sure that it passes a bunch of tests. And rather than writing assert, 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 assert on all of our different you know, components of our data, uh, which actually get removed when you run Python in I forget what the exact mode is, but just uh, super fast, super fast mode. It strips out all the things that are unnecessary that don't actually have any function or, uh, other than just you know, raising exceptions like asserts. Uh, I think it also removes the certain print statements or at least log like debug and info level logging, something like that, um, just for you know, slight optimization tweaks. Uh, but yeah, so uh, we're talking about, uh, Casey's talking about Airflow, which is going to be a lot of fun. And I'm talking about voluptuous and data classes. Uh, to jump right into it, oh, I probably should mention this. This is now our third meeting here at Teeps, which is great for everyone on the live stream. Teeps is great. Uh, wonderful space here in downtown Orlando. They're uh, hiring a senior front end developer. For more information, Visit teeps.org slash careers. Thank you, Case. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, so, yes. Uh, so, we 
always live stream. I mentioned the live stream. That's always at live.pyorl.org. And the video will be uh, available later at watch.pyorl.org. Okay, that's all I wanted to say. Oh, and we're always uh, looking for talks. And I think that one is speak.pyorl.org for the speaker sign up. Okay, so I'm going to go into the thing that I think is really cool. Uh, because Python does but doesn't have structs. Uh, Python has an enum class, it's kind of a struct, uh, but because Python doesn't have static typing, there really hasn't been a need for structs, so we get by using lists and dictionaries and all these other uh, class, uh, yeah, custom classes for just storing information. Uh, and that's exactly what data classes are. Uh, this is a feature that's being introduced in Python 3.7. However, if you have Pyth if you're running something on Python 3.6, it is a pip install with a library that is maintained by the same core developer, uh, developer or developers that uh, merge this into the language as of 3.7, which is coming sometime later this summer. We will see. Uh, this is actually a wonderful little blog post, the ultimate guide to data classes in Python 3.7. Uh, this has absolutely everything you could possibly want to know about data classes uh, as it stands currently uh, and in our little example here uh, they're going to go through a whole uh, building a deck of cards basic examples we're going to actually build one from scratch uh, but we are using a decorator and that's it well I well we're using a decorator and we're all uh, the other important detail is that we are using a feature that was added into 3.6 called variable annotations, class variable annotations. And this is, uh, this is actually what the data class decorator uses to determine what the attributes of the data class should be so it can go in and optimize. Under the hood, it, is, uh, it has some uh, basic equalize, you know, uh, equal statement, uh, the Dunder method. It's uh, building your init for you. It's build. Uh, it's filling out Dunder slots so that this data class is going to be far more efficient and faster for computations than it would be if you didn't apply a data class to it at all, uh, which is really cool. Uh, but yeah, it only will look at the things that use our variable annotate our class variable annotation, so that rank colon the, the type name. Um, so, very simple. We can already start running into code at this point uh, to give an, a, a basic starting point for where might we want to start using data classes. Uh, this is a pretty simple main. This, hey, we're going to run some basic uh, calculations on simulated forum posts. I grabbed this from a website that just supplies sample data that you can use in JSON format. Uh, so yeah, everyone who loves their, uh, we love our Latin for fake data, uh, but it includes the ID of the, of the comments that was made, uh, a post ID that is applied to uh, the title of the post, body of the post, and then an email of the user that created it. So, fairly basic. Uh, we're only dealing with uh, essentially string keys, as JSON goes, uh, ints and strings. Although, we all, uh, later we're going to look at something in Voluptuous where we can actually say this should be an email, which is pretty nice. Uh, but, if we, uh, if we run this through our basic uh, analysis right now. We load in all the comments. Uh, you know, how many comments do we have? Uh, how many unique posts do all, are all of these uh, comments applied to? Uh, something a little more fun. Uh, what is the total corpus length of all the bodies of the comments? Uh, what is the average length uh, number of characters, and then uh, something just a little bit weirder. How? Uh, what are the most popular uh, email top-level domains (TLDs), which is uh, you know, .com, 
.edu, .info, .io, all of that. Uh, so we're actually using a little bit of a Python iter tools uh, guy here called counter where we just give it a list and it returns a dictionary. Well, it's a, you know, a counter object that can be rep that you can convert and represents represent it as a dictionary uh, saying, I found this how many number of times, which is uh, pretty neat. You don't have to actually build that from scratch. Uh, so if we run this, actually I probably have it in my memory here. Yeah, so we're going to run it on a good payload. There's 500 comments, 100 unique forum posts, uh, 80, uh, just shy of 81,000 characters with an average length of 162, and .biz is our most popular TLD for our emails. So, pretty basic. Uh, you'll note that uh, when we pull out each of these comments for comment in comments, where it's a dictionary because we're reading in JSON, so we use our dictionary syntax, uh, you know, bracket, string of the key that we want, uh, the name of the key that we want to pull the value from. If, uh, now, if we look at our list here, we want to represent this as a data class, something that we can say, this is how it's always going to look, uh, so we can remove the dictionary lookup syntax. So instead of uh, this comment, bracket, string, post ID, we can, uh, our goal is to just have it look like that, which looks very Pythonic. And I think is also more memory efficient. Yes, okay. Uh, so that's what we want it to look like. To do that, let's create a new file. And we're just going to call this, or let's save it as comment struct.py. Uh, so with it already pip installed, uh, pip install data classes uh, from data classes import data class, we pull out our data class decorator, and we create a class just like we would anything else. So we, uh, we always capitalize our uh, classes, including our data classes. We don't have to extend anything, although internally this is what is being done implicitly in this case. We can you know, give it a doc string later on, but if we pull this up and go back to our JSON here. We have an ID, which is an integer. We have a post ID, which is also an integer. A name, which is a string. Whoops. Old habits die hard. Uh, body string and in place of a user or user ID we have our email so we'll pop that above the actual contents there but this is our basic data class uh, let's actually fill in this doc string like a forum comment so we go back into our app I like titling I like sorting my imports and all of that so uh, from comment struct import comment and now when we have our comments you know, json.load uh, pulling in our data what we can do is comments equals and use a list comprehension to initialize a comment So this becomes the comment dictionary representation that we pull out. And for comment, actually, I didn't show this on here. When we initialize it, we just uh, we give it the values that we want to initialize it by. 
uh, by default is in the order that they appear in our data class. So our rank uh, queen and our suit hearts. Uh, if you wanted to be super Python 3 about it, you could actually put a heart, uh, either, uh, well, Unicode character. And that's totally valid Python. It looks kind of interesting. Uh, fairly basic. This is what's going on internally to build it. We don't have to do that. We get that by default. Uh, but when we read it in, because we can either do it positionally or it also, uh, we can just dictionary expand our comment to say the ID goes with the ID, the post ID goes with the post ID, and just uh, assign it in that way. So now, if we just come down here and let's say print comments, just the first one there, uh, it will fail at this point, but here's our comment. Comment, ID of one, post ID one, we have our email name and comment body. Cool. Uh, and that's just what it looks like. So now that we have uh, now that we have that, we can start going through our code here and replacing all of our dictionary representations with our new uh, you know, Python, you know, more Pythonistic uh, dot notation, just like we have for you know any other attribute of class. So we already did. Uh, comment.postid. So the next one we have down here for our you know, the total length of everything, uh, we can replace this with comment.body. And down here we can do comment.email. And for this particular syntax, we're pulling out the email, splitting it, and then just grabbing, uh, splitting it by a period, and then grabbing the last item in that split list, which is uh, for an email is always going to be the TLD. So, some fun there. Now, run this, we should get the same output as before. Yes, we do. And uh, from, from this basic analysis, that's all it took was this little bit of code to essentially replace all of our dictionaries. Uh, we can do uh, we can do other things that you would expect classes to do. If, let's say, we created, uh, so we have an email in there. Let's say we want a user ID, and it's supposed to be an int. If we go ahead and try to run this again, it's going to fail on us because we don't have a user ID in there. Uh, uh, however, we are allowed to put default values for our uh, data class uh, attributes. The only thing about this is these now become ordered if they're, uh, if they're not explicitly given in that, you know, that star star dictionary notation. Uh, but this will run now and there we go. We've uh, we supplied a default value. We can also do class inheritance with data classes. So we can pull out another data class here and a class, say, secret, capitalize, because so a secret comment inherits from comment. And on that one, we can do, let's say, secret is a Boolean, and the default value is true. Uh, one of the more interesting thing, or one of the gotchas about data class inheritance like this is if we then did, uh, let's say, secret ID, and it's an int. This is technically valid. Uh, well, actually, I don't quite remember if it's technically valid or not. Uh, the problem is that because 
the init methods take order into account, the fact that this user ID, we supply a default value to it, and then we put in a positional argument uh, could cause a runtime error when trying to initialize this. Uh, I don't know. We can quickly test it out. So maybe let's just open up Python. Say from our comment struct import secret comment. OK, so that's actually an import. Well, it's a type error, but it will be on import. So non-default argument secret ID follows a default argument because it will do all of these and then expects all of these. If we remove this default value, our code from earlier isn't going to run because this is now expecting a value. But if we go back here, exit out of that, rerun it, and try to import again, our problem is solved because now it's expecting these six values and then this value before getting to a keyword value, just like any other init statement would uh, you would expect in, in an init or any other method in Python. Uh, so that's one of the quirks about inheritance. It, it's a bit of a gotcha, but uh, if you're not doing a whole lot of inheritance or you are limiting default values to non-inherited classes, you won't ever run into that problem. So uh, let's, let's actually keep this because this is, to this is still totally valid. Uh, there's a lot of other things that you can get into with data classes, but as far as like a, yeah, like, uh, this is actually uh, heavily influenced by the adder library. Um, I don't remember if the core maintainers are a talk specifically, but this is kind of the predecessor to Python data classes, and now everyone has it. Uh, do, 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 do. Yeah, they're going into there. Type hinting. Yeah, you can use uh, Now, this actually leads into the voluptuous part. How am I doing on time? Great. Um, just because we have to supply an, uh, a type to all of our attributes here in order for them to be recognized as a valid attribute on our data class, this is still Python, and Python is not uh, strictly typed, there's no type enforcement uh, unless you apply something like MyPy uh, to it and any kind of other type checking library. Uh, so if we then try to go in to our bad.json, which is the same as good.json, I just corrupted it in a few places. Let's go ahead and clear this out. And instead we go to bad.json. Do. It did all the bad things. Uh, you'll see that hmm, in our total length, when we're pulling out the, uh, trying to just find the total length using the sum of a list comp uh, in a list comprehension, uh, well, we have an untype in there for our body. So someone posted a comment that didn't have a body to it, uh, just as our first example. Here we can. Uh, well, here uh, we can introduce voluptuous. Uh, voluptuous is a, well, I just pulled up the, the docs there. Let's, I remember. Ooh, it's so tiny. Voluptuous is a standalone data validation library you build out a schema uh, and you, uh, you, initialize, you initialize the schema and then you just run data through the schema. It runs a bunch of validation on it. You can, uh, here you can do, uh, include default values. So with our user ID, if the data coming in didn't have a user ID and we didn't say you're required to have a user ID, we can specify a default value of none or zero or whatever we want. Uh, we can do data manipulation upon validation. So uh, 
if we wanted to lower all strings coming in, we can do that at our, at our validation layer. And this is something that you can include uh, in any project. Uh, in fact, if you're, uh, if you're doing something like Flask or Django, there's the Marshmallow library for running validation on any info that's coming in based on your SQL alchemy uh, table structures. But if you're not using SQL alchemy or you are not using a library that has some kind of data validation built into it, this can be used anywhere. Uh, it can be used in Flask, like uh, Flask RESTful actually just deprecated their data validation uh, tool set in favor of uh, Marshmallow and uh, other tools like Voluptuous. Uh, you can validate any data coming in. You can validate data coming in from third-party APIs that you call just as an extra layer. You can have Voluptuous in there during your test suite. Uh, again, uh, uh, like uh, Great Expectations we mentioned earlier, uh, that's looking at the actual structure of the database. You can then have Voluptuous call some sample data from your database and make sure that the data that's being called is also valid for your application. So let's, go, let's actually just build a new one on this side. So let's call this validators.py. And first thing we need to do is from voluptuous import schema. And let's say our comment schema, we create a new schema. And the our input for the schema is anything that we want to validate against. Uh, if we're validating a dictionary, then we supply a dictionary uh, that expects the following keys and that have the following values. Uh, at a very basic example, uh, we have you know string int int in their example uh, for the doc examples. For us, we would use. Uh, looking over at our data class over here, we have ID, which is an integer. We have <coughs> post ID, which is also an int. We'll go down the list. I can probably just do this. And let's actually include user ID in here, just to further this example. Pop some. Yeah single quotes around these guys to turn them into strings. Man. It's trying to be helpful. Yeah, that's not always helpful. <laughs> if you highlight the text and then press the, the, the quote button, it'll just automatically surround it in VS Code. Ha-ha. 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 I like it. So here we go. There's in so if we go back, uh, so there's our content schema. Oh yeah, commas. Da, 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 da. So this is a single comment schema. Uh, we can go through and we can convert all of these, uh, you know, do a list comprehension and validate all of them, or we can just create a comments schema that is a new schema. However, this schema, I believe this is the right syntax, uh, is just a list of comment schemas. Ha ha. So, assuming this works, well, I already know this is going to fail in one way, but if we go back into our app from validators import comments schema. Let's say so if we're not caring about line length we can do 
comment schema and just give it the JSON data path. Yeah, 82, char 82 characters is not bad for a Python line. Uh, so if we go ahead and run this, let's clear this. This should give us an invalid exception, multiple invalid exception actually, uh, but we are, uh, it is already recognizing that we have a list, so that's good. It is then going through the list and applying our comment schema to every item in that list, and here's where we get our error. So voluptuous.error.multipleInvalid, expect an int for a dictionary value, uh, and then it's going, it's saying that uh, of the data it was given at the 240th item, there was an error with post ID. Now, to pull this back out, because I don't quite remember what the 240th comment is. So let's do, let's look at what the 240th is and why our post ID is not working. So run this again. Ignore our error, but come back up here. Well, we have a nulled post ID. Uh, everything else looks good, however, uh, we just don't have an ID for this one. So, if let's go back into uh, let's go into our ad, and we're going to find well ID of two forty one. And because we can, let's just fix it. So post ID, this is supposed to be 49 because it's, yeah. So it's supposed to be 49, woo, we fixed it. We found one thing that broke our validation. Um, if, you're, if you're using this as the first layer of an API, that means that the user didn't supply the data that you expect. Pretty simple. Um, however, for the purpose of showing something else off, this will work. However, yeah, so if we go back in here, uh, now we have a new thing that's giving us an error. However, we should never have an ID that is less than one. Makes sense. So what we can do in our validators back in here uh, from uh, voluptuous, uh, we can import more things from voluptuous. Uh, I don't know how soon it's going to actually show. Yeah, there's showing valid and schema. Uh, here we go. So uh, now we can get two built in validators of voluptuous. Uh, there is one of length, all, uh, which is the first one we're going to look at. Uh, so for uh, a string, uh, well, actually for all, it needs to validate all of the following things. So we're still giving it, we expect it to be of type string, and then in this example, uh, we're expecting that this length to be a minimum of three with a maximum of five. Um, for, our, uh, for our use case here uh, with these ints, we can actually import all and another one called range. So same basic idea. We can go in here. It must put, this must pass all the following validators. It must be an int, and it needs to be. It needs to fall within a range with a minimum of zero, and then we don't put a max on it. So now, if we rerun this, we should fail on that item again. Or did I save it? Well. Let's get back. <laughs> we'll get back to that. I think it's just failing on another thing right now. Ooh, lightning outside. Uh, this is uh, this is supposed to work. It's going to work. And because we want our post IDs to also do that, we can put that there. So actually, and the ID was failing on the next one. So let's see what happens there. OK, so here, here it happened. Uh, value must be at least 0 for a dictionary value, blah, 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 blah. We get our post ID. Uh, in fact, uh, I'm not sure if I'm going to remember this off the top of my head, but if we actually let's actually, let's look at this. This is 
part of that useful Python. Uh, so we know what items we're looking for. We're going to try to initialize this data, which means uh, we're going to pull out our exceptions. We're going to look for, uh, let's see, from voluptuous import invalid, uh, there we go, invalid and multiple invalid. Just pull that out. Does voluptuous have a lot of built-in error cases? Yeah, there's, uh, these are the, these are the two that, uh, two most uh, widely, you know, all the exceptions that will pop up uh, if there's user problems. Uh, other ones are, well, we couldn't initialize your validator because you did something wrong. Uh, but if you're just validating data as it comes in, those are the two that are most likely going to be thrown. Let's actually, oh, as, you know, our little exception so that we can work with it. So let's print out that, and for the sake of my memory, let's also print out the directory, because there are two things that I'm specifically looking for. So run this again. Well, and then we didn't, we didn't exit out of anything, but we come back up here. Uh, value must be at least zero for dictionary value. That's what we saw before. Uh, add args, uh, I think it's args. Or, no, or it's either args, errors, or and or message that I'm looking for uh, here. So let's move this down a little bit and figure out exactly what that is. So instead of dear, let's let's still print out our exception. Let's print out exception dot args. I want to do exception dot errors and message. So what we're, look, uh, what we're looking for here is exactly the value that failed. So value must be least zero, blah, blah, blah. Uh, there's our, our message. I'm still not seeing the exact value that it failed on. Uh, I'm not going to be able to look it up here, but there is a way to pull out this exception and say, here's the, here's the value uh, and in the object. So we see the minus one. Yeah, exactly, uh, which makes for great error messages. Sure. Perfect. Um, but not quite sure what's going on there. And uh, a bit of uh, Python bit, I have this as a main, and it's supposed to be a, uh, I, I'm using the begins library, which we've covered before, as a way to build a command line utility. And in proper Unix fashion, your command line utilities should always return an integer, zero if it was successful, and anything else for you know, look up the error code in my giant book uh, in the old days. So we can just you know return one, and then we won't run into all this mess, uh, this mess down here. Yeah, ta-da, we're out. So now that, now that we've shown that the range actually works, let's go ahead and fix this. 39. Uh, let's, let's run into our other error, which is on our ID. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. Oh, let's go back into app and pull out is it 354 just so we can go back in and fix everything one at a time because I messed it up in a bunch of ways that have very specific errors to showcase. Uh, so ID is, actually, there we go. That's why it failed on this particular time, because hey, it's not an integer. So let's go back into a bad debt JSON and fix the mistake that I introduced. Oh, single. I had single quotes in there. Da, 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 da. There we go. So let's run it again. Okay, we expected a string value for dictionary there. I think this. Is just, I think I just nulled this one. So, oh, I'm searching the searching the wrong thing. Probably if I just search for null. 
yeah, that's the that's the one. There's only one left. And for the sake of not destroying our numbers, because I don't remember what the post is. Let's run this one more time. Hmm. Well, it ran, but now we have a different error. We still have, you know, our comments are all fine. You know, we have our characters. It's less than before, but whatever. Uh, but we have, hmm, Rocky or Rich, lol, gotcha, as a TLD. That doesn't seem right. So if we go, uh, if we look this up, I just removed, you know, I just made this not an email address. I just replaced the, you know, at sign whatever it was with ha, gotcha. So if we, this is bad data. If we want to identify this, then we <coughs> would need to, you know, we would need to build something that says, I recognize this as an email. Uh, I'm not going to go into how to build your own exceptions, but you can. And uh, I actually had some, I've had some fun with, uh, or my favorite so far has been uh, matches a regex expression. So uh, if we were ba you know, back in our validators, uh, let's, uh, if I had that bit of code on me, uh, we could do all. And then let's say we created one that says, you know, matches RE. We could give it you know, my regular expression here, and it has to match that regular expression. They're pretty cool. Uh, and it's possible to make that. However, because. There's also a non matches. Uh, well, I, that's one that I made. So oh. you, you could put a not at the, at the very front of it, or, or just, you know, matches RE. Because uh, yeah, you, you want to say what's valid if it's not valid. Exactly. Yeah, um, the the cool thing with this is all of these you know range all you know our our fake match or the the custom matches re one. All it is is a function that needs to take a value and returns a value. So uh, act, let's just make one because uh, that's all it is. Um, and the other thing is. It, it doesn't even have to validate anything. It just needs to return a value raise or raise an exception. If we wanted to, uh, let's not create the matches RE1, but if we just wanted to create an upper, upper function. Ooh. Oh yeah. Post, uh, oh. Yeah, let's include that later. Um, this, okay, so let's say we are given upper and down in our email, let's, re let's replace this. So let, uh, if we have upper, it expects a string and the thing with this all or any is it does it in order. So if we say all string and then after we can, uh, all the validators that we put after this, it's already validated that's a string. So it's not going to fail there. Uh, so we can actually do, you know, string, let's close that off, and it's going to return a string. Uh, and then we can just return, you know, object.upper, because we know it's a string. Uh, so rather than this upper being a validator, necessarily, uh, it is just something that goes in and changes the value of it. So on this email, Actually, let's, no, yeah, on this email, if we go down here and we say, you also need to match this upper, and we don't actually need to initialize it, we just need to give it a function. Uh, these we need to initialize because it needs to know what the min and max values are and anything else that we give it. But if we go ahead and run this, assuming it doesn't error on us, all these are now uppercased. So we have our bulk data transform in our validation layer. That's pretty cool. Uh, However, this upper, we don't need to do it because we can, if my memory serves me correctly, or we can go look at the documentation, that it should be in utils. Upper should run exactly the same. Haha. -ha. So all uppercase. And there's a bunch of other things. You can do capitalize. You can convert things to a list, you know, concatenate. Uh, dictionaries as well, but we still have this Rocky Ulrich Lolgotcha in here. So uh, I think in 
the primary voluptuous validators one. I think there's also email, ha, huh, commonly used. So we can replace our upper with email. Go ahead and run this again. Let's actually look what's going on there because I didn't actually test this with voluptuous earlier. So, actually, we're still printing out the thing from earlier. So let's see what our email looks like in here. Oh, function email. So email does require uh, initialization. I don't remember what the parameters are off the top of my head. Uh, message. I guess we can prepend or uh, postpend anything, but we let's see. What you doing? Let's look up the documentation because it's been a while since this one. So voluptuous.validators.any and I think all of these, all of, everything in validators should already be imported in there. So schema email I'm not sure what's going on there. Uh, maybe we just can't include it in, or maybe instead of any, we just say email is an email. Hmm. I'm trying to remember. Well, let's just. I'm wondering if, well, so voluptuous dot validators import email. I, that's what the that's where it is in the docs. It sh I shouldn't have to do that. I don't think. It's treating it like schema, so I'm not quite sure why that is the case. Uh, maybe I just need to, well, yeah, maybe we need to embed this as another schema. No, I, no, that's what it has here. Could just, yeah. Well, yeah. Oh, that looks right. Yeah. Network. yeah, I guess, you know, the pylint is not very happy right now, but it works. So I could probably get rid of the schema. I could probably actually just put this back in all, you know, make sure it's a string and an email. We're just not supplying it anything, and pylint doesn't like that. But it still works. So, all right. So, if we go back into bad and find our, well, it should be right here. And we go ahead and fix this. This you know, AOL.com. That should raise an error. I think that's it. That's it. So, back in here, back in our app. We have, uh, we, it, uh, in one fell swoop, we changed uh, one line of code, just importing comments uh, into, well, here are five lines of code. However, we've done validation, we've uh, converted things to data classes. However, here's uh, another fun thing. Let's say we do require that our comment, it must have a user ID. Uh, 
good. Ah, there's one other thing that I want to show off. It must have a user ID. Um, rather than going through all of our data and applying, uh, saying, you know, we're just going to put in a bunch of dummy values here, and at our data source, what we can do, well, if we run this again, we're going to get that error saying argument required user ID. We can go back into our validators here and uh, say that, well, by deep, let me actually think. Let's, if we go in here, I'm going to just remove this post ID. Um, rather than wanting this to, uh, if, if any validation is, you know, if something doesn't validate, we want it to error at our validation phase, not our uh, data class creation, which is what's going on there. Uh, so what we can do, I just removed post ID from our bad JSON here. If I run this again, uh, well, acquired, well, it ran into that, but it would run into it anyway. Uh, yeah, I'm going to forget this, so let me just add it back in. What we can do in our validators here, we can say, uh, I think the default is required equals false. We can say you are required on validation to include every single one of these. Uh, so if we run this again, rather than it being on our data class creation layer, we are now catching, hey, you did not require a required key, or you did not provide a required key, which is user ID. So it's now catching it there. However, if we really did want to make user ID optional, Instead of saying required equals true for our schema, which requires every single key in here must be available, uh, it's going to look a little more funky, uh, but we can do it. So back up here, uh, not default, we can do, well, we can do required to say these are all required, and this one is optional with the default value of none. Uh, I'm actually wondering if I look in here for defaults, if there is a better way of doing that, utils.default2. So I am curious if instead of required, let's import uh, default, default2. And how might it be used? Schema default to 42 gives 42. So let's say default to none. Um, that should that should do it. We're not running any validation on it, but that should at least give us default values. Uh, or maybe we put it in all. Just try it. Let's see. Just try and remember. Or, well, I guess if we went through and did require default equals none, we could do that. But let's say we just default it to zero for a user ID and then uh, verify that we have an integer. That might work. No. Well, uh, I am actually, well, I'm getting close to time, so let's just, rather than going through default to, let's do required. So there's a required key, and we can set the default to be none. I'm not sure if that is going to pass our int validator. Yeah, okay, so expected int for dictionary value. Uh, this is saying we're going to give it a default value and then run validation on it, so we can't really nullify ints. However, there should be, uh, well, actually, we can also do this to just kind of bypa uh, bypass that. We can do uh, another one called in. 
and as basic as you can get. Um, it's just going to be in int or none. Maybe, no, actually, it will, in, that's actually not going to do it. It did it. Haha. -ha. Okay. <laughs> I will take it. Uh, typically, when I use in, is something like um, I'll do, uh, let's say we have a tag. And we expect, well, it needs to pass all the following validated. It needs to be a string, and it's going to be, you know, in like a, a predefined list of, you know, let's just say open closed. So uh, it must be a string and it must be a known value that is in here. If it's not, then it's not accepted for through validation. Uh, we don't have any of that, but we can get rid of that. And I think we can now also do required down here equals true. Rerun that. And we are now requiring every value in there, including this kind of little interesting way of providing a default value even when there is none. Uh, so now, when we get to our data, our data class implementation, we go, okay, yes, I, through my validation, I have guaranteed that you will always receive a user ID, and we don't even have to worry about default values. Cool. So uh, now, <laughs> now to wrap up. Uh, we loaded, uh, we validated, and converted all of our dictionary, our comment dictionaries, into comment data classes, which we could then go through the following down here and make it look nice and Pythonic. We get rid of that you know, key lookup syntax that uh, you can imagine gets, you know, well, it gets very long for nested values. Uh, there is a slight or one of the limitations is that um, if you are reading in values from a data source and they use hyphens in their keys, you're going to need to replace those with underscores or something else because you can't uh, you can't use hyphens in here because now if we did that, we're now saying comment.post minus ID. So that's a, uh, that's one little gotcha. Uh, I believe there is a way in Voluptuous to actually replace a key value with something. So uh, it's not required, uh, not the required one. But you can say, read in this and replace the key to this. Uh, pretty simple there. Uh, but this combination of data classes and valid, uh, Voluptuous or any other validation library is very powerful so that you can make very clean looking Python code uh, and uh, uh, also have better error messages for any of the users using your uh, system, either you know, direct users or internal company users, so on and so on. Uh, that's all I wanted to get to, and I really like it. Uh, yeah, so, so yeah, data classes is coming in 3.7. You can get it right now running 3.6 through a pip install. Uh, I haven't tested this bit yet, but if you try to pip install data classes in 3.7, it just doesn't install it. It doesn't install anything useful. I don't think. Uh, but that's it for me. Woo. <laughs> All right. One question. Yeah. Uh, excuse my ignorance. What is EPL? Uh, e actually, would you like to answer this one? Extract, transform, and run. Yeah. Yep. So you're extracting data from your source, whether that's an API, a file, or a database. You're loading it into a system, whether that's your process, like scripts like this, or whether it's your system, another database source. Um, and I skipped transform, but transform is doing all. Uh, I was like, what are you doing? Hey, online. Um, transform is taking that data and reshaping it or converting it from a CSV to. Converting uh, it. Yeah. There's uh, ETL, there's ELT. Uh, they strip, uh, you don't typically do the other two before you extract the data in the first place. Uh, but yeah, it, it's just all, uh, how do you build your data pipeline? Speaking of how to build a data pipeline. Exactly. So I will go ahead and get off of this um, so you can connect to it. I will connect to it.
Uh, well, you, you don't worry. Uh, don't worry about OBS. This is uh, AirPlay up to the TV conference oh. room, just so you can get up here, okay. and I'll take care of the rest. Okay. All right. Is this Huddle or Large Com? This is Large Com. So. Yeah, it's going to be like a huddle. No. <laughs> <laughs> they have a huge <laughs> that we've never seen. Glass ceilings? Yeah, really. Maybe it's just a really big huddle. I don't know. Uh, come and sit in one of these two. Oh. We can get your face in here. Oh. <laughs> I was looking up validators as you were going. There was a maybe. But it doesn't enforce the type afterwards. It just checks that you have either an int or a none or something like mm -hmm. that. And you could say, maybe it's an int or maybe it's nothing. Uh, but that doesn't enforce the typing. Like, all right. So again, I am Casey. I am a data engineer at Pluralsight currently. And I'm here to talk a little bit about Airflow. So. Who has anybody used Airflow? Ayo! All right. Um, this is just a quick, like, getting started look at what's going on. But um, basically, you have other engineers in your company, you have analytics engineers who just built that lovely script that Michael built. They, they did a process to clean some data. And now that script needs to run daily or hourly somewhere that's not their computer. What do you do? Where do you put it? How do you make those logs accessible to the entire team? How do you bubble up all of that information about that process running on a schedule? You could do that, but there's a nicer way. Um, okay. Okay. Um, real quick, I have a couple other tabs up. There are more than just Airflow for this. Airflow and Luigi are two of the biggest Python-based, um, essentially ETL platforms or apps. Um, uh, Luigi is a little bit, I've heard it's simpler. I haven't worked with it very much, but it's a kind of lower level, um, doesn't have as much of the nice, um, it's not as feature rich when you go to the GUI and it's like got these pretty dependency graphs. Luigi doesn't have that. Um, Azkaban and Uzi are Java-based implementations. So a lot of this sprung out of people with Hadoop clusters that wanted jobs to run on a schedule and to be able to see the dependency graphs of those jobs. So you have this job that curates this like source data and then it branches off and then they merge back together again over here and they wanted to be able to kind of see how some of that relates in the task form. Um, but Airflow is just one of your options. You have multiple, but it's a good one. Uh, it was originally out of Airbnb, actually. They developed it in-house in, in <laughs> <laughs> um, in and open sourced it. Um, and it's currently being incubated by Apache, which is really cool. Um, it hasn't, it's a, a, a relatively mature um, project, but the incubation process isn't done yet. So we can expect more, even cooler features in the future. Um, so. Airflow. So a little bit. Yeah. Uh, you want to make the text bigger? Oh, yes. Is that kind of better? A little better? Only a little better. Okay. So Airflow at its core is actually a Django app. So this is something you download and you kind of generate a Django app to supply the graphs and the uh, logs and all the cool stuff I was just talking about in web form. This is essentially um, right after you install, well, even before you install, um, this is what you need to get going. So you would export a home uh, variable for Airflow. You'd pip install the Apache version. Um, don't do the air, don't, don't pip install Airflow. It will take you on the circular route through all of these old caches of, of uh, projects that are not up to date. You want the Apache version. Um, but then you would just initialize the, the database it uses to track the tasks and spin up the web server. So to get started with that, let's do it. Boom. I'm 
not gonna bother giving it a home for now. I'll get to that when I need to. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit install. That's still really tiny. Bigger. Hit install Apache Airflow. So it's going to go through and uh, download all of its dependencies. It uses, um, you can use some Jinja templating in the command line to provide more interesting um, feedback for your tasks as they're running. So it collects all of the logs um, for any task you build and host with Airflow. All of the logs, if you route to standard out, it'll collect that into one centered place for a task or a DAG, as we'll see. And then it will um, just kind of pip that out for you. Which is really nice but it needs all those tools um, right there so our next step bear with me today guys I was in bash all day all right that generated the um, underlying database is needed to serve that data to a web browser as well as run the, the, the jobs themselves. And now we're going to serve the web server. Airflow. Dag bag. Dag bag. I like the names associated with this project. Dag bag. Like your ASCII or <laughs> yeah, yeah. How we know here. Fan it's gone. Yeah. And then you get a bomb explosion. Something yeah. wrong. Yes. Bad thing happened. Mm, it might actually be. It might actually be live. Let me see here. Like local host eighty eighty. Yeah. Mm. Window. There we go. It's an Ta -da! So that's the nice thing about this um, is that those few steps give you a bunch of examples on how to use it. Gives you pretty much everything you need from the operational side. Um, so this is an example of a DAG, and we're going to take a look at this real quick to get everybody oriented, and then we'll go back to how you actually structure a DAG. Um, so an example bash operator. Uh, this is the tree view. So within a DAG, you have connected tasks, and it's tiny. Let me make this better. There we go. Um, there we go. So DAG, you have run this last, which is, um, I'm going to assume it's a process. It's a named process within this DAG. You have another one, which is connected to run after loop. And then there is, after all of that, also run this. So these are separate functions. And you can think of this as like, maybe it's a Python file being called. Maybe it's just a straight up bash operation. Um, it might be an entire Docker container that's been initialized and runs and then closes out. So this is how you would start to build a DAG related to maybe a specific data flow through. And then um, see or get some sense of how they get uh, connected. So if you start building in cron jobs, that will be one of your first questions is where does this go next? So they tried to answer some of those questions. It's not perfect, but um, it's pretty good. What does DAG stand for? Ah. Directed acyclical. Yeah. Ooh. Directed acyclical graph. Acyclical. Yeah, you said it right. Ah. So um, what that means I can't remember what it what it is, but what it means is it's actually a graph-based view of looking at all of these connected um, uh, tasks. So, like like that. Exactly like that. That's a DAG. Okay. We're gonna make a DAG, but that is also a DAG. <laughs> um, it also means there's no cycles. It doesn't. You cannot 
Mm -hmm. One of those leaf nodes you can't go back to. Yes, so that's really important. Thanks for bringing that up. We have a process, and you'll start at one, and you will end at n, and there's no like, oh, I wish 4,000 more wishes. It doesn't, we don't cycle back and start again. It's, it's a process that ends, um, in contrast to other types of um, uh, task Maybe. management systems. So, so some things you might want kind of like constantly listening or constantly running, um, this would be a end process. So if you have streaming data, this is not necessarily your best option unless you're just taking a snapshot at certain times. So this is for kind of, it has uh, refresh states. Um, up here, real quick before we move on, it's got these codes that's really handy too. Once you actually run or as you are checking the status of your uh, directed acyclical graph, um, each of these will light up with the color that it is and it'll change shape too just to indicate whether this one has succeeded and this one is running or this one failed or for some reason this skipped, whether you have any retries set or not. Um, It'll just give you a status as well as the graph, so you can get a snapshot view of where it is when you kind of visit the, the website. So. Uh, there are a couple other views here. Um, more data available. Task duration, it can just let you know. Um, it'll give you a graph over time if it's running four minutes and then four minutes and then four minutes and then four minutes and all of a sudden two hours that lets you know you have a problem um, so it, that's a helpful check if tasks keep retrying again we have no data but if one task keeps retrying it has a specific check for that um, I think two I don't remember where other things. We'll have more in here for me to, to navigate when we have some actual data going. So um, back to the home page. Here's how you turn it on. Boop. That's fairly simple and easy to do. That's actually, it's quite nice because it's hands off the database or the, the server. I kind of like that. You don't have to manually jump on. That reduces the if somebody else is doing it, you don't have to check them for errors. It's not a separate PR review process. It's just, is it on? Has it run today? Um, you can see over here, schedule. These are our normal cron um, annotations, plus some niceties. Um, you can say, do it once. Uh, this one has none specified. So that would be something you would maybe go on and trigger uh, based on a target. And the last cool thing that I'll point out before we actually get into some code is that you can actually get to the code from here. So um, that's really handy if you're like, where is this like, uh, where's this log statement coming from? Where is this uh, log level set? You can jump into the task and kind of see how it's constructed. So. Uh, for the actual DAG itself. So this is the DAG file. So you have a bag of DAGs. This is one, one DAG in your bag. I'm not going to get tired of saying that. Um, if we start at the top, this is just a nice view of the code. So I'm going to start here and then we'll move into making our own. Um, we have, they include a license because this is a standard one, but there are some imports that you need. Airflow, obviously. They're using bash operator and a dummy operator. Um, you will need to import the DAG model so that the uh, Django app can see your DAG. So that's how it kind of knows what this is and how to interface it with the, the GUI. And then they're doing some stuff with time. Um, for each DAG, um, you will have some details on it. You'll have a couple arguments. You can set the owner. Um, this you would update to your email or however you kind of address yourself at work. Um, and then there's some weirdness going on with the start dates. I think this has been in process, but you need to give it a start date that is before the actual current date. Um, otherwise, it will 
blow up? Question mark. I don't know. I haven't delved too many too much into the issues related to it, but it seems like something they're working out through the incubation process. For now, it started two days ago is kind of the standard. Um, and then here's how you actually specify your DAG. So this is kind of specifying the DAG as the model. So you're giving it an ID. So here's where that name came from. You're specifying its <coughs> arguments. We separated them out here, but you can actually just pass them in here as a dictionary if you so choose. Um, you can schedule the interval here, and then you can give it a timeout. So if this runs for too long, just cancel it and assume it was, it was a problem. Um, and then you can jump in. Um, they include some dummy operators to give a, a sense of like the, the, the flow for the example, but one of the main operators um, that we use is bash. So this is really cool because you can actually, um, from this, it's like you have access to a command line, essentially. You can just go in, you can say Python, my file, path to my file, run your file. You can um, initialize the Docker container. This is how you kind of have that functionality. This could be a function that triggers a bunch of other scripts that people are constantly updating or working on. Um, you can actually also build functions and your Python code directly in um, your DAG with Python operators. So that you, it's like, uh, which is essentially you're at the terminal and you say Python, whatever you would then say next. So you have that command line uh, hook here. There are, um, just for scale, where'd they go? This many operators. Um, there's direct connections into Hive and um, MySQL, Postgres, Presto, if you want to use that versus the Hive connector um, and a bunch of other ones. So there's a lot out there. There's also, you can schedule emails based on certain data sets or email somebody an update. There is a Slack operator. Um, I'm working in a prior version of Airflow, so it got a little buggy for us, but in the new versions, it looks really nice and it's working really nice, um, which you have a Slack channel that just keeps tabs on your data flow, which is really cool. Um, yeah. And then you just kind of schedule your task like this. And then just let it go. So let's make a DAG. And there's so much that I'm not going to cover in this, this little demo, um, but just to get a taste on what is possible. Something in Airflow is calling Flask. So yes. Flask go by. I thought it was Flask in out of C block. Mm -hmm. Oh, it might have started on Django and then migrated to Flask. Yeah, I'm on one seven, so I thought it was upgraded to Django because I didn't see one nine in mm -hmm. Airflow, so I didn't know. Um, I think they're using the Flask based. I think they're getting the Jinja templates through Flask, but I'm not 100% sure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I can't. I, no, you're, uh, or so someone typing, typing, typing really fast, fast, typing really fast on the intermittently. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like either that or it's raining, it's not. So I'm like, is, there, is it flooding? <laughs> I don't know. I'll be afraid to open that door. Yeah. There's just that one developer that's working late in the middle of the room. <laughs> I don't, enough, engineer. I don't hear enough backspace. He's there. got that mechanical <laughs> keyboard. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's <laughs> really I'm debating on getting one, but I yeah, work with all my family and kids would kill me. <laughs> <laughs> you, you can
can get a, a clunky mechanical keyboard to put on top of your smartphone. Yeah. Wow. Clink, clink, clink. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Airflow web server. So, no, I don't want to put in logs. I just want to put it off. Okay. This is why you give it a home before. You don't rush through and think, oh, I'm live demoing. It's going to be yeah. okay. Don't be like me. Exactly. <laughs> it's the authentic experience. Everybody um, wants to see you do it for the same reason they want to see you ride that shopping cart down the hill. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. The, the crash. And uh, my experience with Airflow, it crashes. How often does it crash for you guys? I'm going 1.7, uh, okay. using the UI a decent amount. Okay. A lot of thread locks. Pickling errors. Yeah, we have a really, really uh, fragile production server. We probably we hold a lot of commits back, and then we're like, is it okay, yeah. folks? <laughs> and then just kind of go from there. <laughs> I can see the utility in this. I've used a proprietary product on the, that did this sort of thing. And it was a big, clunky program that crashed a lot and cost a lot of money. So, mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it, it, something you need if you have job streams and they get beyond trivial is to do installing. You've got to have something like this. And Cron just will not cut it. It'll just go crazy. And then, like, the, 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 the cost of third party ones, like the ones that you can buy, they're all UIs driven yeah, and stuff like that. It's, it's like having you have version control that stuff, right? That's all done through the GUI, right? Your transformation yep. yes. there. Porting um, between versions yeah. is horrible. That's why I love this, is you can just commit your DAG. Yeah. What changed? I don't check your change log. <laughs> <laughs> what did you do? What how did you do? How do you keep your developers happy? You keep them in their preferred text editor. <laughs> Okay, I have the wrong one opened up. I've done quick demos for a lot of people, and now I have a lot of abandoned. Uh, mm -hmm. Deck directors. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm not proud of what I've done, yeah. but. had all disappeared. <laughs> Interesting. Would you have given demos on your work computers? I have given them on both my work computer and my personal computer. Um, I guess. So you're looking for the logs, or? No, I was looking for it. So. When you have successfully found your Airflow server, first of all, you've given it a location. Yes. Second of all, you will see a folder of DAGs because otherwise it it doesn't know where to pull for these uh, these processes. Example DAG slash. Can you check the config if you're looking for where it's pulling? Mm -hmm. Admin, I think, and then configuration. There mm -hmm. should be a DAG. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> should probably explain Let's go yeah. here. Yeah. Okay. There should be. Yeah. It'll be in your user root workflow. Yeah. So I, I do believe I'm at the right one. That's where it's pulling from right now. And then airflow.config, which would be that one. Yeah, I need to make this directory, which I have. OK. Cool. That should be working. OK, so I believe based on this is the correct location, or that's the log file. But the way they know where your 
they assume that your DAGs are going to be in Airflow slash DAGs. I've just made that DAGs folder, so it might be taking a second to refresh, but typically once it starts to recognize that DAGs folder, it will, um, it updates automatically. It'll, up, it'll uh, live update to see all of your DAGs, but I don't believe it sees our DAG as a DAG yet because I don't have all the templating. Grab it from here and tell it that there is a DAG here. Probably have to give it a different ID. So it's time delta. Time yeah, line. you didn't import time delta. Oh. It's just uh, from daytime import time delta. Filled up the bag back automatically. There it is! Yay! All right. Woohoo! Here we have our demo bag. Okay, cool, here it is. It has no tasks, just a DAG. So we have no dependencies yet, but we can add some. All right, so. I'm going to copy paste and make up for a little bit of lost time. But so let's say we have this bash operator and we have my etl draft. Right. And in my etl.py, we're just going to Dab. Dag. Dag bag. So this ETL pie file you can imagine would be um, either the data validation we just did or uh, pandas load processes or anything like that. Um, from here though, we're just going to pretend and we're going to call our bash command which here. A little bit more space and slide and instead of echo one we're going to say Python main and copying the path of that file and inserting it right here into our 
bash command. So right now we have a DAG scheduled for midnight with a timeout of 60 minutes, and we will see one. one task to run a Python file. Let me move so I can really actually I can move this right now. Cool. So we just refreshed our demo DAG page and now we have one subtask <coughs> cache operator. So I'm going to go back to here. Yeah, you and I can actually. So oh, it automatically looks up um, all available operators that don't have a downstream available. I, I, I saw like, it, it populated the the DAG graph from before, but there was no, uh, other than the initialization. They are under the ASCII or aren't they? That, that is some nice ASCII, ASCII. Here, I'll do that. That's it. Let's go over here. <coughs> the latest none type has no attribute latest execution date. Yeah, I've seen this bug before. It's just because the DAG never ran before, and then you try to hit start on the DAG. So it goes oh. for the previous run and goes <laughs> and fails. Gotcha. Um, Is that solved by if I just trigger the, it by the command line? Uh, I think so. Um, usually, what I do is I go in and click on the tasks I want to run and just try to force run it. Like gotcha. In that one situation. Okay. But if not, in real life, I would just wait for the DAG to actually be scheduled. So okay. They UI's it. You could just uh, run the file. Uh, I saw before it would do uh, if name equals main it uh, got CLI. Would that? Say name or uh, In the in the demo DAGs that they have, the last line was uh, if name equals main uh, the then DAG dot right, right CLI. CLI. Yeah, yeah, and it will call itself. Yeah, I don't do it that way. That's I guess that's, that's, what, that's what they're doing there. But uh, we we could run it directly, and then it would fix yeah. that error. I use like I usually go say Python the, the DAG file um, to validate my my Python, just mm -hmm. so I you know just right off the pop, and then uh, you can call the task directly from your CLI through Airflow. You so Airflow mm -hmm. run the name and give it a couple more options, and it'll finish run. So when the UI is not responsive, because generally. Ah, okay. There it is. Huh. So, I've seen this before. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go to. You probably have to run it from the CLI. Yeah. That's cool. That, that one I don't understand why they, they chose to do it that way. Because you can, you can choose multiple executors to run this on, like seller executor, distributed queue. Or you can do it via the, the local executor, Mesos executors and stuff like that. Um, but the local one, the one that's default, you can't from the UI trigger a job. It's like why would anybody need to do that? ID. This is my task ID. I'm going to take that and airflow run task ID. Um, I saw positional arguments up there uh, DAG ID and task ID. Mm -hmm. Oops. 
Excuse me, things over here. Okay, execution date. Well, uh, it's uh, it still needs the DAG ID in there. So, oh, okay. like Airflow run uh, demo? No, demo, uh, demo DAG. DAG. Need an example. Yeah, wonder what format wants to take it. I know the format. You so know the format? You're standard. Standard, yeah. But I'm going to tee, though, make sure you have a tee. Oh, okay. Oh. It's easier to grab it from the UI. If you click the UI, it'll give you the information on the specific task, because I'm lazy and I don't like to think. If you just click the run Python in the box that comes up, the message mm -hmm. box at the time, uh, it doesn't have the TLC. So the older versions do This is the older version. But you can just <laughs> grab that and hopefully it'll run. Check yeah, maybe it'll fall. There you go. Yeah, I just there it is. Think there you it is. pull that out and put the T in there, yeah. yeah. Capital T. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So let's see. Hopefully it works. It should print something. Yeah, it looks like some task. It's running some task. 1.0. Oh, yeah. So it didn't, it didn't print anything, but it ran. So the print, because it went to standard out, it's going uh, to be in the log. Hmm. Yeah. Yes. Dag bang! There it is. <laughs> it is. Uh, okay. Always home directory your airflow projects. Cool. So that is the first thing. Now, I've done, believe it or not, I have done this before. And um, there are a lot of cool things you can do once you import the logging feature of um, Python proper. So you can tag um, SQL Alchemy logs, um, logging levels onto um, those connections as well. So you have validation that you can do. You can also stream the logs of the type of SQL Alchemy connections you're making. Um, and the schemas you're passing over the, the data line. And then once you actually get the data, you can, um, or if you're making API calls, you can stream the SOAP log out to the same location. And all of those, even if they're in separate files or disparate, they all go to, um, if they go to standard out, you'll get it collected here. Um, yeah. And same thing with data validators being printed to standard out, just like we did earlier. If you get any errors, they'll get all collected in small. I can work on some, we can like, I don't have any local uh, major databases set up right now, um, but we could do some more bash commands or could come up for questions or if, if you have any other thoughts. We show like a relationship right now. I think we just have one task oh, that ties yeah. to the task downstream. Yeah. see the flow of what you're relying on. Mm -hmm. Can so. you pipe the output of one operator to the next? XCOMS is a feature in Airflow. Um, okay. it, it, so that you can set it up so that when that bash operator task instance runs, so the actual task runs, when it gets returned from there, it gets pushed to this thing called an XCOM that your next operator or any operator in that DAG or other DAGs can then Oh, cool. Is that in the, the older versions? See, you, I, I'm going from 1.7, so okay. I'm assuming that that okay. might change, but uh, yeah. Cool. It's, uh, and you can actually use that through your templating, because your bash command there is actually a Jinja template. So you, as you can see there, right in the code, which is mm -hmm. run ID and dag run. Yeah. So you can actually get the, your XCOMs there. Cool. That's awesome. So, T. To exemplify. Let's 
So echo the bash command to print, um, and then actually going to. So the set downstream is an, the task is an object. So you're calling the set downstream method on the task and passing the task ID within that same DAG that you want to run. So now we have run this, which is our, our first Python file, run, and then we have... Would it be task? Like, uh, t or uh, it would be run this? Because uh, uh, we're just looking at Python code, and so you'd be passing in a variable? Mm. Like uh, on, on the examples here, you have run this dot set downstream, run this last, and run this last is just another operator that was listed above. That's from this task, so it still hey. should be a task ID. Well, they happen to be named the same thing. Oh, I That's see what all. you're saying. I see what you're saying. So instead of this, it would be uh, just run this. I suppose it takes a list so you can give it a list of operators. Mm -hmm. So if you have that type of dependency, um, that works. Okay. You can also use the, uh, the less than, less than, or greater than, greater sign to indicate upstream or downstream. I don't know. Okay. So let's go back. Is that, is that what happens when your DAG runs into a runtime or a well, import error? Or is it just, yeah. Yep. So. So this we can kick off in the same way as the last time. Probably, it's probably because it's like that Jinja plate is looking, our Jinja template bash command is looking for run ID and dag run that don't exist. Mm, that's true. So instead, set them as variables up here. Yeah, that's like super cool. Yeah, I'm telling you, there's, some, there's like a leak going on in there, and there's no coming tomorrow for work. And it's probably nice. Like, what? I think so it's nothing seeping up from under the door. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, they're on the same. Yeah, it's, it's, yeah it's, it's okay to open the door. Like, it could be something's leaking, but there's probably also a drain in the floor. Yeah. Weird design. <laughs> oh, <laughs> weird water aeration system. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's not raining, so they want to be wet. But uh, sure. Well, it's quite dry. I bet it's just up the road. Don't they? Don't don't run right into open the road. Yes. Don't run the floor. Yeah, probably have to be set up. Uh, well, let's, let me check the, the example from earlier. Yes, just where, where are those? I can see there's a significant learning curve in this product. Right after you run your first, uh, your first project, yeah. Um, just where where is the DAG run in this file? Uh, I think it's being passed. Um, 
that's the template, so the context is getting injected, and you're probably right that the DAG run was not initialized, that's where we're getting the none error. Mm -hmm. So it's trying to still inject that DAG run there, which then it probably hits another none uh, for there. So if you take those templates out and just like run something else. I um, tried it just over overriding them, but. Oh, that didn't work? Mm -mm. Yeah, because they have to be injected to the context. Um, oh. That's, um, that's out, of, out of the scope of the task run. Uh. To echo something, see if it works, and then uh, we could use like execution date, which would be nice, which would be uh, the handlebars, DS mm -hmm. handlebars, right? And that just gives you the, the uh, template for it. Okay. I don't think I've ever heard anyone refer to that as handlebars. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> you never use the template of handlebars template? Double curly, open I, double curly brace. Yeah, too many words. Cannot use the top temporal language handlebars. Curly brace is redundant. Yeah. The braces are curly, and the brackets are squares, and you never have to say square yeah, brackets. Yeah, but people say that they're changing. Because they don't. They don't, they don't <laughs> have, yeah, if you work with students, like they always yeah. have them messed up. They always have them messed up. I've heard it as. Uh, Handlebars as well. All right, cool. I'm not crazy. <laughs> no, I'm not crazy. Because I say it in my head all the time. Well, that's where I work alone, so you can. <laughs> <laughs> well, so like your cat. Yeah, yeah. My 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 three year old knows. I I usually when I see it, I don't think I'm not thinking. Oh, this is a curly brace. You go. Oh, I'm creating a dict. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or a set. You see it as a C++ program, you say that doesn't do anything. Got one set of braces on gate. Go within the scope. Doesn't do anything. I'm going to use that so much. I can't believe you weren't already. I know. You're going to be like three times faster. That's getting injected too. Um, Let's run it. So with uh, with the Jinja templates, you don't need to explicitly give arguments like you would with normal Jinja. It just brings well, it does. Element. Airflow does it. So when the task gets run, it builds up something called a context for the task instance, and in that context, that context, which is a dictionary, gets injected to the Jinja template that you can then iterate and do. I don't know if this is going to work. Uh, replace the uh, percent sign with some empty oh, handlebars. Yeah, empty handlebars. There are dictionaries here, I'm sorry. Yeah. The double handlebars. If you're running on 3.6, you can use a formatted string. <laughs> you have a year and a half. Toward Spark, I don't know if it works for free. Uh, yeah. Uh, have you been trying any PyTorch? This is not able to uh, compile right now. Really? Just Python on the file? Would that might show that us? That might give us a clue, right? A clue of an, uh, mm -hmm. an error? That's like my first go to. Because therefore runs inside of a virtual virtual yeah. environment. We'll switch out the that virtual environment. Gotcha. Yep. Configure that first. <laughs> Let's see that. Demo airflow, he says. It'll be fun, he says. Mm. Okay. Configure it and don't touch it. <laughs> Honestly, when my airflow server's got to restart, it's like, all right, we'll schedule a late night. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no. Or uh, Travis CI. At some point, you'll have to Jenkins upgrade. Jenkins. If you have to upgrade, 
Yeah, I have systems like this mistakenly have upgraded by doing a pip install by accident. Oh no, no. I tell my boss, I go, um, it's gonna take a few minutes. There should, we should have a console for running the web server. There should be errors coming out of there. Is there one? Like the, uh, the you didn't redirect the output, right? Keeps it in the console, so we should probably see errors. Um, yeah, yeah, that's that's the right one. Is that the right one? There were errors up there before. Let's check. Airflow doesn't have to be, well, does Airflow the server need to be running to just use the Airflow command line utility to um, run things? You can, you, you don't, so there's like three components. There's the web server, there's a scheduler, and then there's workers. So mm -hmm. the default installation spins up 16 workers, which are Python tasks, uh, Python processes. And uh, you, I think you can have the scheduler and the workers working. Well, I'm sorry, if you're using a seller executor. I guess, because I never use the local executor, you'd probably need the web server one, I'm assuming. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because you usually wouldn't use the local executor in production because it's just for web testing and tracking. Mm -hmm. Sure, but it doesn't seem to like this either. So, for the sake of hang on, um, go. I go on. I'll go on. <laughs> yeah, we'll do it Fair. separately this year. Can uh, we try something really quick? Go oh, back yeah, to the please. CLI and uh, put two optional parameters to the CLI command. Do uh, dash dash force and then space dash dash ignore dependencies. I just want to see if it's clogged because it's, it's not meeting the dependencies. Oh, wait, ignore dependency. I'm sorry, it has an underscore between it. Okay. Yeah. And see if that works. That's like my cool. I just. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. I just. So before I run that, I had just switched out the task name, run this, for the task ID of the previous bash operator. Should I switch it back to test this? It's um, definitely run this. Yeah. It's okay. not the task ID because um, there's no reference to it because it, it's. Yeah. Okay. That's it's just another variable. Cool. Let's do it. Hopefully, this will get it to run. It says it can't run it. So it was probably the, the dependency was not resolving, right? It was saying, oh, this didn't run yet, so okay. I can't run, so stop, mm -hmm. right? Because it's managing it. Okay. Do you want to see if the Jinja templating thing works? So it probably works now, right? Probably works now. Sure. Yeah. I'd probably DS there, just DS for date string. Uh, the, it's the, the run date of the thing. Gotcha. Uh, because the other one, we needed the DAG name because we were not officially running the DAG and probably not an all out. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. I think that SpaceX is launching. <laughs> Stuff and then get annoyed by 
they're all launching in the middle of the night, and I sort of get used to that because, you know, they kind of do it on a regular basis. <laughs> when you're used to, you would hear rumble, rumble, go back to sleep. Now you hear rumble, rumble, you start to go back to sleep, and then there's a giant sonic boom <laughs> that wakes you back up, and then you're up for an hour because SpaceX has got giant ideas. <laughs> When I was working out there, when I first started working out there, the shuttle program was still there. I was in the shower getting ready for a work thing, and I was in the shuttle room. I could like, yeah, go straight to the logs. <laughs> I'm like, I'm surprised that the Jinjin template had DS. Like, just echo DS in there, and it still ran. Yeah, because uh, that's there's uh, you know when you write you use Jinjin templating library for it, um, so you have to give it like some type of dictionary that gets injected um, with key values or dictionary whatever objects you're doing. Airflow builds this thing called a context for that run. So it has a lot of stuff in there, and one of those things is DS, which is the execution date of the mm -hmm. task or the DAG that you're running. Um, there's also things like, like I said, the XCOMs. There's, you, there's macros there, so you can take what's my current execution date minus seven days, which is a common reporting thing in the mm -hmm. last seven days. Um, a lot of stuff like that. They, yeah. And you can actually give your own objects to that context, too. So you can tell the DAG. There's this other thing that would let you add to the context. Well, we did a thing. <laughs> did we see the log that said that, that check the log for the task? Let's see if the date showed up. Let's check and see. That's the log. Are we in the right task? Uh, dang, dang, I not. feel it was, isn't it? Yeah, we're in that one. Good. Gotcha. That's the run to Python. Kept running the next in line, we didn't run the other time. Oh, yeah. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it only ever runs the Python, uh, the <coughs> run Python file. If I omit the task ID, will it run all tasks or do I uh, need that's to? That's a different thing. I think it's Airflow backfill or something, or there's another command, subcommand. Be wary when using it. <laughs> because when you say your DAG starts two days earlier, well, if oh. your machine's been up for a long time, two days <laughs> earlier was a long time ago, and you say backfill until now, it'll, it'll backfill all that days. That schedule's weird. And let's say if you have an hourly DAG, and it's mm. been up for three months, so and then you try to backfill, it, it'll spin up a whole bunch of jobs. And if you're running on Spark jobs, putting up a bunch of clusters. <laughs> that sounds like a fun. It's it gets run away. It's scary. <laughs> to say the least, we're like, uh, yeah. We use auto scaling clusters, and we sort of the max and min. So as more jobs add, this starts adding more EC2 instances to the cluster, which costs more and more money. Oof. So. Uh, for the. For the you uh, for the GUI there, uh, or oh, I guess for the schedule interval, there was a at midnight at daily. Uh, can you do at now and just have it run as soon as it gets added in? Like, is there any way to say just I want you to run this at ASAP? So I don't know. Like I know there's a one that says at once, right? Mm -hmm. And then so it'll run once as soon as you turn the scheduler on. So it'll just run. But like knit right, so that would be now. Yeah. As soon as it gets. So then, I had one of the ones is like, how do you get one to always be running, right? And like, mm -hmm. that's always a common question. And I, that's there's, I haven't found a good solution. I think there was one in the examples that showed a, uh, a triggered one mm -hmm. that I haven't used yet. Um, so if uh, it, 
in our custom DAG, if we change the uh, the schedule to be at once, it then gets included automatically in the next refresh, yep. and we just turn it on. It auto you know, runs immediately, and then when we click into it, we don't get that last execution date none exactly. type error. Exactly, you can clean that up by running the DAG once, however you want to run that DAG. I've noticed that an initial run has always been, it always kind of throws that error when you try to start triggering that. So. That's cool. The Python callable can add to contextual info to the DAG run created by way of adding a pickleable payload. Conditionally trigger context. Context run. That's cool. One thing I noticed is like when we're writing a DAG, we're getting people to write DAGs. Because usually mm -hmm. what I do is I develop the operators mm -hmm. to, to, to connect to things and do things. And I have other engineers building the DAG out for their workflows, right? Um, so um, I just lost my place where I was thinking there. Sorry. Uh, so, oh, well, yeah, now I was talking about. It's really good to go through the cut of the already built operators and sensors and know what's there before writing your own. Because mm -hmm. most people start off, I'm going to create a bash operator, do my work, or I'm going to create a Python operator. It's like they already have S3 operators. Why do I get to write bottle commands to copy S3 <laughs> when they already have them? So people spend a lot of time developing their own, and you're like, dude, they already have them, they're already made, and they're, they're contributed to, right? There's, there's a whole bunch of them mm -hmm. for all the, all the big data platforms, all the AWS, Google Cloud Storage, Azure. Yep. It's cool. There's also a Gitter, right? What's Gitter or Gitter? Glitter. 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 Mm -hmm. um, but once it's scheduled and going, it's like hands off it runs. Um, so it's, it's really useful. Anything about the schedule, even just cron jobs. You just want to test your cron job? Yeah. You know, okay, well, what time is it? Okay, yeah. one minute. I'm going to set the cron job for one minute. Yeah. I'm going to wait. Oh, I missed it. Oh, that's the time window. Okay. Yeah. So you two, two minutes, two minutes. Wait two minutes for your run. Mm -hmm. And then you discover it doesn't have, of course, cron, cron is no context. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's something that we're flying, it's online. online. On all this is, and that's a generic problem that gets, I guess it gets rolled into this in some yeah. ways. What, what's, oh, what it's I, a lot more functional. Yeah, hugely more functional. What I find a lot of value on this is we have a bunch of data teams where I work. Uh, a lot of people are doing other data things, not using Airflow. What I love doing is I have basically these these tasks are either run daily, weekly, monthly, um, every hour, and I can go on to the UI, click a button. And say, well, what is the state of my hourly DAG? Mm -hmm. And I got a bunch of green icons mm -hmm. saying, everything's cool. All right, I get to go. We also have Slack, like you were talking, integrated. Probably heard my phone go off a few times. <laughs> so we got Slack channels for notifications, like a Hive table, was, a new partition was added, mm -hmm. which is useful for us. And then we'll have things for like a job failure. Boom, mm -hmm. it'll alert me. So a, task, a Slack integration is awesome. Yeah. Um, it's very useful for this stuff. That's you awesome. Can, they actually have an API, an HTT, uh, a RESTful API. Mm -hmm. Did you know that? So you can actually send messages like you can. I didn't do this yet. This is what I want to do. Uh, Slack. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. You can write Slack commands to talk to your uh, your uh, Airflow environment to then trigger the job. To run. So if the job fails, oh, it, my cluster came. I just need to start it. Boom, we start it right through Slack, yeah. which is really cool. Awesome. And there's a lot of other automations once you give yourself a RESTful interface. I think that's experimental. Though, so so uh, implementing that, you would have say a single DAG. And your two starting ones would either be, you know, uh, it got triggered normally, or it got triggered by a Slack operator, and then goes through the. Well, you could say the like what we the did in the UI. She, we, you click the button, mm -hmm. and you said force run. In the usual sense, when you're using a different executor, it'll work. So when you when you do that through Slack, that's what you're doing. You're calling the API to force run that task again. So it wouldn't be like a separate um, operator to do that. It would actually be a command against your DAG, mm. not build your own operator. Uh, you can, there's Slack operators, which are nice because you can say, this task runs, trigger a Slack operator to say something. 
There's also a fallback mechanism, so if a task fails, run this block of code, which then you can call the Slack operator. It's automatically register all your Slack failures. Um, there's also uh, data dog um, um, operators, which are great, right? Um, we've interfaced with Logly um, because this all going, what you're saying, it's going out to um, using standard Python logging, which you can configure for Logly, so you can gather all of your all of your airflow logs and put in Logly or some other source too, which is useful for log aggregation because even though you get to see all your logs across everything, we have like 50 DAGs, mm -hmm. right? Still, you got to kind of look at everywhere, so then we kind of funnel those into Logly and then write um, triggers in Logly to say, oh, this job is getting out of control or something. That's so, awesome. Yeah. yeah, I came at our, we have an older version of uh, Airflow, and I came at it from writing just smaller DAGs, and yeah, I was yeah. writing the, the processes and throwing them up there. But then I learned that the, the great organization is like evaluating this versus just like writing everything in cron jobs. And yeah. I'm like, I, I, I know it's buggy, but yeah. like, I mean, you know, I've only been working with this technology for a couple months, but there's so much there. So I, I, I love, I, I think that the, the overview yeah. is just like the, the selling feature. Absolutely. So I have to sell this all the time to new developers on our team because uh, I joined a team where a lot of the ETL processing were in like Jenkinson. Jenks jobs, right? Wow. And so, like, we they had plugins installed to manage dependencies, mm -hmm. but they were really bad. So when we started doing this, I have to sell people to take your jobs off of Jenks and put it in Airflow. And it is a hard sell when you're doing, like you said, the demo ship breaking. Right? <laughs> like, oh, no, it's really good because like, you don't have to <laughs> no, do anything. No, guys, it's great. Yeah. You know, um, so once it's up and running, yeah, once it's up and running, because it, it, the UI is good for monitoring. It's not really good for triggering a job to run. It's it's really meant for monitoring. It'll actually, I think somewhere in the documentation, it's not a, a real-time UI. Mm -hmm. Like if the tasks are running, you have to refresh the page to see it. Maybe they'll fix that in newer versions, but so you have to you have to work at it. The UI is kind of neat, yeah. but it's a lot of information. The graph view that you first showed is great because it shows you failures over time. So that tree view, as you run more tasks, you can look at like where my jobs have failed in the past, right? So you kind of build up like information about that. Um, we're having that problem now with a couple data feeds where data's been failing for a long time. So now we got to backfill that data. All we got to do is tell Airflow, Airflow backfill that date, and when the report comes, it comes with this. That's pretty awesome. Uh, That's awesome. That's really cool. All right. I that would be it for this month. Woohoo! We got through ETL for the first time in a long time. <coughs> Our <coughs> yeah, gonna die. Um, yeah, so uh, big thanks to Casey. Awesome. The airflow talk. I ran out of time to. I'm to type in the Python uh, program line. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like, oh, I touched that thing. Yeah. No way. Uh, yay, live I software. Time yeah. to prepare. I mean, for, like, I've been doing it for about a year, playing with Airflow, and still I would have, I would be doing the same things you were doing. Oh, it blew up. Ah, it blew up again. It's a pain. Let me show you these screenshots that made last week. Yeah. <laughs> That's the ultimate fallback. Right? Yeah. It's okay. We... We do not judge here in case things explode. I've no, had plenty of things explode. No, no, we are not, no, we are not uh, decision makers. Yeah. <laughs> no one's Nope. Oh. Oh. Here. And uh, oh, a uh, big thank you for filling in for Vanessa this month, short on short notice. Uh, so yeah, next month we are uh, Vanessa is going to be giving a talk on deep learning. So that's going to be a whole lot of fun. That's going to take up most of the time, but uh, uh, always looking for talk proposals. Uh, intro about ten minutes. Uh, skill. 15 to 20 minutes, and a main talk can be up to an hour. Uh, we take it all. Uh, that uh, So uh, sign ups at speak.pyorl. Uh, uh, yeah, actually, you can just go to pyorl.org for the meetup page. It takes you directly there. Um, and the videos at watch.pyorl.org. Uh, other than that, we'll see you guys here next month and 
Not sure what we're going to do after that. We'll see what uh, talk suggestions we get in. All right. See you guys next month. I appreciate it. Thank you, guys. And goodbye, everyone.